Good evening and thanks for joining us on the webcast this evening. I'm Martin Sill, the Police and Crime Commissioner. I'm going to be joined by Rod Hanson, the Chief Constable of Gloucestershire. And we're going to go through a few issues which we think will be of interest to you. One of my roles as the Police and Crime Commissioner is to hold the Chief Constable to account. So we're going to cover some of the issues we think will be of interest to you. We certainly hope so anyway. Um, I'm going to ask Mr Hanson. Mr Hanson has been our Chief Constable now since uh, I think May 2017 and before that you were the Deputy Chief Constable for I think since May 13 I think. Yes. So you've been with us quite a while. I've been here since you know the end of 2012 so I guess a lot of what's uh, going on now is down to you and I and we've been at the helm so we really can't shrug those responsibilities. But before we start going into too many sort of more detailed questions I think the public would like to know what your view is the state of the force. You know, what, what kind of shape is the force in? What, you know, how do you feel about, you know, about the force 12 months in? Thank you. I, I mean, I genuinely feel very positive about it. Um, when I first took up office in May last year, you'll remember, Martin, that I tried to articulate my own business plan in support uh, of the Police and Crime Plan. And there were three elements to it. One was around stabilising the organisation. Uh, the second was around ensuring that we stayed locally connected to the public and the third was to make sure that we were maturing our thoughts around how we would become a highly digitised organisation. And the last 12 months has been focused on the first element uh, and the second to some extent. Um, and I'm very conscious that we started to re-recruit again, um, having stopped recruiting for a couple of years before that, which is painful for the organisation, but we're on the up in terms of recruiting. We have a three-year forward-looking plan around that. The biggest development there, I think, is around uh, making sure that we've embedded and continue to embed uh, a supportive leadership and wellbeing culture, and I can give much more detail on that in due course, but I think that's been a bit of a game changer in terms of uh, our workforce feeling supported, and that then translates into the way I hope they deal with the public and interact with the public, and we've relaunched uh, our neighbourhood policing office, so I'm, I'm pleased that that's happened. Um, Contextually, I suppose, um, it's not lost on me that crime is getting more complex. Um, even five to ten years ago, it wasn't common knowledge to talk about things like modern-day slavery, human trafficking, cyber-related crime, um, very personalised crimes that require more time to deal with properly. And they require um, compassionate staff to build a rapport to then investigate. Um, and our staff are predominantly single crewed at a time when the security threats at a modern, you know, contemporary high, it's enduring, um, and they're going to, you know, incidents, uh, single crude as I've said, but they're, you know, also checking the cupboards for food in case there's um, child neglect. They're looking under the bed for cash in case there's money laundering. They've got to make sure the dog's not dangerous under the Dangerous Dogs Act, and then deal with the investigation. Uh, I'm not saying they can't do it. I think they do a magnificent job. But that's a big change, I think, in the last 12 to 24 months. Okay, so. I think we'll, we'll, we'll go into the budget a little bit later on. And I think you talked about recruiting. Now, last year was the first year we had any kind of an increase in our budget, I believe. Well, I know, I know that's, that's the case. So that was why we could recruit a few new ones. We'll come back to that. What I am hearing from the, from the officers and, and from yourself as well, that the officers are getting tired. Um, injuries are up. And I think it's important for the, the public to know how you're looking after the st your staff, your officers. You've got 1,800 people under your command. That's an awful lot. Uh, we hear it all the time in the press that they're, they're under pressure, that they're burning out. Yeah. But you've given us a pretty good organ you know, pretty good overview that the force is in not bad shape. We shouldn't worry too much. But are the officers okay? And, and it, what are you doing to keep them that way? Well, I, I think we are in good shape, but that's due to the tremendous efforts of our staff. And my job is to look after our staff so that they can look after the public. So the engine's running quite hot. Um, let me just unpick a few of those points, if I may. The first is in relation to assaults on officers. It's unacceptable. It does happen. Mm -hmm. um, and we've done a lot to, uh, to work with the, the court system uh, to make sure that those who commit an assault against a police officer or any police staff member um, pay a suitable price for that in the courts. But moving on from that, we have uh, recorded 88 instances of um, assaults on officers over the last um, uh, calendar year. That's an increase from uh, 28 last year, 30 the year before, and 11 in 2015. So the indications are 
and the stats show that there is an increase in assaults on police officers and um, frontline staff, including our PCSOs. We've put in place um, a seven-point plan to deal with injured officers. Uh, we link them very closely into occupational health services. We have the TRIM process, which is trauma risk um, management, which is a, a way of de-escalating some of the trauma they experience, not only from the incidents they deal with, but from the assault itself. Um, and it's a fundamental part of our leadership and wellbeing program to make sure that if our colleagues get injured, we look after them properly. Uh, and everyone that gets injured that comes to my attention, I make personal contact with. So we're trying our best to make sure we not only prevent it, but look after our staff. Okay, that, that's good. I think, you know, the, the public have to pay for the service that you provide. And we, we spoke about some extra officers, which we'll come on to more. The other thing that the council tax increase paid for was body-worn canvas for every officer. Um, I think the promise is they would be in this financial year. Is that going to make a real big difference? Is that something that's for evidential capture or is that going to make a difference? Well, we're trying to make sure that uh, large decisions that we make, especially if they're expensive, and body-worn video is costing us about 1.3 million to roll out. Um, and, and by the way, that's uh, well advanced and maturing. It's already been issued to roads policing officers, firearms officers and dogs, uh, dog handlers. <coughs> Uh, it's been rolled out to uh, those who protect the royal households um, and we have a, a programme to roll it out further to all frontline staff including PCSOs uh, by the autumn. So uh, the decisions have been made, the money's been set aside and you've mm -hmm. supported that um, but the reason that we're doing these things now is um, through a lens of well-being and uh, protecting our staff. Yes there are business benefits to body-worn video. It I'm told reduces the likelihood of uh, not guilty pleas, crack trials. So there's there are benefits throughout the criminal justice system, yeah. but up front um, we also know that it reduces complaints against officers dramatically, and it gives them a lot of confidence, particularly when they're single crewed, to go into more confrontational circumstances, knowing that the behaviour of the person they're dealing with or the group is recorded, the evidence is put up onto the cloud so the camera can't be stolen from them and the evidence lost. We've thought that through very well and we're promoting it very much as uh, an efficiency piece, but more than that, uh, a well-being offer. Okay, so I think you convinced most people it's good for the police, for the officers and for the PCSOs. Is it good for the public? What difference will they actually see? Will they just feel a bit more big brother? You know, is, is it good for the public and how will they, what difference will they see, do you think? Well, it, it, let me go back to the welfare point again, if I may. It's good for the public in that if officers don't get injured as yeah. a result of wearing the camera, they're on duty. That's the first thing in terms of the public visibility. Great for the officer, great for yeah. the public. Um, but we know that um, it does encourage uh, early guilty pleas, admission and interview. If you have a vulnerable witness who's nervous about reporting the incident and then going to court, if somebody admits the offence and doesn't require the witness to go to court, that's got to be good for the public as well. Mm -hmm. So there are significant benefits across the spectrum. Okay, and I know you're a very fair chief constable, and we always have a policy of less people going to court if possible, because we don't want to see people in the criminal justice system unless they need to be there. Now, I'm always astounded by some of the behavior and language used in our town centers. So trying to prevent people from actually committing offenses, being obnoxious, pushing your officers, fighting, all those kind of intimidations, what would your message be to the people who get ready for body-worn video, modify your behaviour? What, what might that be? Well, for, uh, first of all, um, behave uh, where you can in society. I, I know that pragmatically that isn't always the case, and we've yeah. witnessed that all. You know, I've witnessed that all through my career. But the difference here is that um, if you misbehave in front of an officer wearing body-worn video, it will be captured and it will be used to help promote a prosecution. Okay, I think that's kind of. A potential difference let's just explore this I think I, I know how busy your staff are you know on a Saturday night Cheltenham Gloucester or wherever you know somebody uses absolute foul language they can't take them off the streets immediately because they've been left after I think that's a fair assessment so if somebody is abusive you know verbally aggressive to an officer disrespectful in a way that is is totally acceptable is that just going to be recorded or do the police intend to do anything with it or, or the crime prosecution service or is it just there in case. It, it'll be key evidence and we can use that to then pursue the investigation afterwards. A, a single crewed officer going to the scene of, um, of a fight in, in the nighttime economy 
if they've got an injured member of the public who's perhaps bleeding and needs support and an offender walking off, their priority is to address the needs of that individual on the ground. If it's been recorded on their body-worn video, then let's deal with the person who's injured and needs our support and then let's deal with the offender afterwards. And if that means going to find them a week later, then we'll go and find them a week later. Good. So there's a message there. If you're the kind of person who tells the police to F off, you may um, come Expect after them. knock on the door. Knock on the door. That's a good message. I totally support that. It, it kind of would be remiss of me not to talk about the budget. It's in the papers all the time. Budgets are falling. I think, I, I'm, well, I know I'm right. There's been no increase in police funding from central government now since 2010. It's been either cuts or, or a freeze. And um, we know that will continue at least till 2020. I think that's right. So I have the responsibility, apart from just holding you to account and trying to build up a really good police service, of trying to make the bills um, as low as possible and making the budgets balance. Last year you asked me if I would increase the council tax by £12 per year, which we did, and I think there were three or four main areas that we, you said you would deliver if, if we did that. Are they all on track? I think some was recruitment of officers, wasn't it? Some was a body-worn video some into our child protection services and so on. Is that money being well spent now? Yes, it is. Um, the body-worn video we've talked about, it's a mature programme of work, uh, very well thought through uh, with the right devices, um, full rollout by the autumn of this year. So mm. yes to that. There was a uh, some of the money set aside for um, increasing the number of schools liaison officers. Yeah and we uh, wanted to recruit six of those. Four of them have been recruited. A fifth is uh, a transferee from another force awaiting vetting clearance. And the sixth, uh, we're just about to go back out for advert for. It's a particular kind of officer with certain skills. They're being trained, they're being issued with the right equipment to operate in schools. Uh, and, and we've been working with education professionals within the county to make sure that we can set the right curriculum to resonate with, st with pupils in a whole range of schools, in including uh, independent schools and learning academies. So um, last year the money's been well spent and there was an uplift in some detectives to help in the vulnerability public protection area and they've also been yeah. uh, put into place. I mean certainly I know that you were uh, determined you would get that uplift, you felt you needed it, but let's be honest with the public, um, again no more money from central government not making a political point, there was no more money, so any increase has to come from local taxation. Um, there is a 2% increase for officers, which has to be paid for now out of the budget you've already got. And I know you're going to come back to me again, and we've already discussed it, about there needs to be another increase. That's another burden upon the local taxpayer. Before we go into what you might spend it on, just how essential is it? Is it would it be nice to have some more money, or, or is it essential now? Well we've tried to maintain a responsible approach. Uh, the country is still in, in austerity and we don't want to waste money. We should play our part in the recovery, the economic recovery of the country. Um, but it's getting to the point, having lost over 320 people since uh, 2010, um, that we're very very close to uh, making difficult decisions about what we can and cannot reasonably do. We've always tried to avoid, Martin, the conversation around what are we going to stop because nothing's trivial in policing. Uh, but there are consequences to losing that many people. Mm. I'm, I'm certain that um, uh, you know, a, an increase in the precept, I could give you a list well beyond what you could raise the precept to and it would all be for noble work within policing. So it is tight, uh, the money is very much required operationally. If we get it, uh, we'll use it wisely. If we don't, we understand, but it will be tougher. Yeah. It, it is difficult because I know the maximum that it may raise by is £12 a year. And it, somebody said to me, that's only £1 a week, that's no big deal. But actually, I'm looking at it now. It's, if, I know a lot of people who can afford it, I can afford it, I presume you could afford it, but a lot of people can't, and it's £1 more that they go into debt potentially. And I know you and I don't want to see that happen. So I do want to be sure, and I've already indicated, I, I don't mind saying it today, that I don't think that just almost to stand still with the pay rise in inflation, um, it needs to go up by 4% because only half of our money comes from central government, the other half comes from local taxation. Mm -hmm. So almost to stand still takes about 4%, which is quite a lot of money for the public to pay. 
but I do have the option to go a little bit further, you know, but to, to take it up to just five percent. And this is not great for someone like myself to say I want to put tax up. I really don't. How worthwhile would it be to put it up by the full uh, twelve pound a year next year? How much do you need it? Well. It, if it was less than the full twelve pounds, um, my plea would be to spend it on uh, roads policing, reinforcing roads policing. Mm -hmm. There are aspects of the strategic road network in the county which I don't believe are being policed um, mm -hmm. well enough. Uh, we want to deny criminals the use of the road. We want to be preventative in terms of those killed and seriously injured, uh, and we want to be present doing the work that we've probably stopped doing enough of because of austerity. We're looking to bring, and we may well come on to collaboration and, and the Triforce arrangements later on, but we're looking to bring our roads policing back into the county and our dog section. Um, and to do that requires a little bit of an uplift if we want to provide the public of Gloucestershire with a proper offer of roads policing. That's point one. The second point is around increasing the, the number of local investigators that we have to deal with um, the less serious crime, which we know irritates the public. We're at stretch with it because at one end we're trying to deal with, you know, a terrorist threat and deal with um, serious and organised crime, um, gangs, and at the other end we're neighbourhood problem solving with community concerns. And in the middle is is an amount of crime which uh, needs addressing, and we're struggling with it. If I'm honest, so we would reinforce that. If we were given the chance to go to a full increase in the precept, I would look to spend some more on a public contact programme where we know that we want to give the public as much choice as possible in how they contact us in a very modern way without wasting money and changing the culture of the organisation to one of much more service recovery, um, giving people channels of communication uh, and making sure that we resolve things before it becomes a complaint because we're just taking too long to address their issues. So there's some work to be done around public contact. Good. So in summary, do you think Gloucestershire Police can take any more cuts? No. No, I, I absolutely agree with you and I think you know I've already indicated I said again here on camera the, the council tax element of, of policing for policing has to go up next year just to, for the survival not survival of the force but for a quality service to make sure we keep the, the county safe and we will be discussing over the, the next few months how that, that increase is spent so we can keep it to an absolute minimum my personal view is that it's unfair that it all lands on the, I don't, don't want you to comment on this, it's slightly political, all falls on the local taxpayer, whereas businesses, the Amazons or, and the Facebooks who should be paying corporation tax don't contribute to it. But that, that's just uh, the, the way, it, way it is. Let's talk about Rose Policing then, because you all know from our conversations that I really feel we've got a bit of a problem there, that our specialist Rose Policing has fallen away too far. There's no blame to be attached to you here because I know the money is, isn't there. Um, before we talk about just collaborate work, well, in collaboration, I, I don't think I want to say just how low we've gone on Rose Policing. The M5 doesn't seem to get policed, the A417 doesn't seem to get policed. We never seem to... And come back to me if I'm wrong. That specialist work around keeping the roads really safe and, and, and denying the criminals the use of the roads seems to have fallen away. Am I being unfair or is that is that right? Well, we, we won't go into actual numbers. We are present on the highways, um, but it's thin. And uh, taking £30 million out of a £110 million pound budget over 10 years has its consequences. So where does that come from? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a lot of resource that's had to be removed. Um, and of course that means we've spread what we've got left more thinly. So we have great men and women uh, in the roads policing unit uh, working very closely with their armed response vehicle colleagues, uh, dealing with high-end threat, uh, but we want to do more. And uh, if we could increase just by a small amount the number of resources that we have within the roads policing department, we can start to reoccupy some of the roads that don't get policed enough. We can start to maximise the technology, uh, such as AMPR, which um, gives us good intelligence around those who are using the network for criminal purposes. Mm -hmm. We can link that in with our prevention work. We have 158 plus special cons uh, constables, many of whom are interested in working with us on safer social driving, policing the roads network, working with our collision investigators and our comms departments to put the right messages out. So there's a lot going on in relation to safer roads, but uh, a little bit more capability around enforcement and presence 
and therefore education would be welcome. It was really just before I took office all the work was done to say look cuts are coming, big cuts are coming, let's muck in, let's, let's pull all these resources with other forces with Avon and Somerset and Wiltshire and I think it was, it, I know it was, we put all our dogs into a big pool, all our cars into a big pool and firearms which is a little bit different. And now you and I have decided that the dogs and the farms are cut, no sorry, the dogs and the traffic police are coming back under your direct control rather into sort of middle ground. Are you comfy with that? Yes, and let me not step away from the history of the fact that I helped to write the business case to collaborate those three forces and yeah. those three capabilities uh, all those years ago. But that was before um, the thrust of austerity kicked in, the context was different. And whilst there have been tremendous benefits around interoperability, learning, standardisation of um, practice that have come from the collaboration, it's kept us safe for five years plus. Uh, the, the time is such now where we want to take two of those capabilities back through agreement with our partners uh, in Avon and Somerset and Wiltshire. So it's being done in a very appropriate way. We'll still work with each other across the border. We'll still have protocols where we can assist and support each other as we would beyond even those borders across the country if need to be. Uh, so we still want to be a good neighbour and a good citizen to the rest of the country to provide those assets where they're needed. But with extra local control and some additional resource, I feel that we can genuinely close a gap on some of the areas that we just haven't been able to address in recent years. So I know you haven't got all the resources you would like. So, so we know that, I think it's April, the dogs would be purely back under the your command of your officers for the same April, yes. with the road policing mm -hmm. and I acknowledge as it is now there's not enough to do the job that we ask of them um, and, and I think it's right to say that fatal crashes are on the way up at the moment which is a big part of their work or certainly they're not going down as they used to so that that'll be okay we're not we're not doing that for the farmers officers as well though are we because that's a different kettle of fish Yes, the, the, um, there's a very successful collaboration between the three forces with our firearms um, uh, officers. It, the, the, a key reason for not doing that is that uh, uh, taking that apart um, at a time when the security threat is so high would be unwise. But also, uh, and probably more compelling, there is a, a, a general sense that Firearms officers are very much connected to a national network, um, and that means beyond just the borders of Avon and Somerset and Wiltshire, our two partners in the collaboration, but up north to the north of our force, and maybe contributing to the, the wider security threat. The armed response vehicles are local, and we want them to be present, but part of a more emerging national network. And so we've thought about this very carefully spoken to the national leads who have uh, expertise on the, on the topic and we've come to what I believe to be the right conclusion which is that firearms and firearms training should remain collaborated with our two partners at Roads Policing and Dogs to be returned locally. Okay so I, I guess that it will be up to you where the officers go for the for the um, the, the dogs and the most police, and they'll be integrated back into neighbourhood police and specialist police and with, with the response vehicles. Speaking to some of the farmers' officers, I much as they they like being part of a, a national network, I think they still feel very much part of Gloucestershire, and they're not they're carrying their guns all the time. They're not using their you know they're not being deployed to farm and stuff all the time. Are they going to be sort of lost to the Constabulary or will, it, will they still feel part of the family and your command? And I think it's quite important to know where they sit. Now, we have good agreement with our partners as well um, that they are still very much a part of Gloucestershire Constabulary. They still wear the uniform of Gloucestershire Constabulary. The vehicles will be branded uh, as Gloucestershire Constabulary vehicles. They will patrol from their normal base, their operating base, within Gloucestershire Constabulary and the majority of their taskings will be within the county as they have been for the last five years. They will however of course be part of a larger network of resources so that if the threat just over the border requires a surge of effort from us we would go across anyway and help them yeah. and then they would return back and patrol. So think of them first and foremost as 
specialists in a high threat area with great skills working interoperably, uh, interoperably with two other forces but um, very much a part of the fabric of Gloucestershire yeah. Kista. And we discussed this at length. I think it's the right decision to be networked in. And really, no, really no choice. And I think our, our friends in Amos Somerset and Wiltshire would be very supportive. One of the major parts of my policing crime plan, you, you know, is neighbourhood policing. It's something that historically I felt was falling away. And I really un do understand why it was falling away because the austerity appeared to get to such a level we thought funding was going to drop even more. Where very sensible people, people I respect, were saying, you know, we're going to barely be able to actually attend all the incidents we have to go to. You really can't have neighbourhood policing at this price. But, you know, I was absolutely, absolutely determined that we would never lose that connection with, with the public. And I thank you for the work you've done that, your team. Neighbourhood policing is back. Are, are you, how is it going? Because you haven't got the additional officers yet. And not just how, how is it going, when I know you don't have enough resources, perhaps for Rose Policing, you don't have enough resources to attend every incident that comes through, you don't have enough resources perhaps to put into child protection, all those areas I know you would like to put more in, let's say not enough. How do you make a decision to decide what to put in one part of the sort of rural areas, how much to put in another area? How, how do you go around that process? Because it's a huge responsibility. Do you mean in relation to neighbourhood policing? Or yeah, well, or where does neighbourhood policing fit into that? Because yeah. I, I know you would like more officers for, you know, child protection work. We know we'd like more officers on, on those policing. We know we'd like more officers over there. But the demands of the public to keep it all balanced, how do you balance the organisation? And where does neighbourhood policing fit into that? Is it a bolt-on and nice to do? Or is it fundamental to what we're trying to do? No, it's a, it's a fundamental part of, the, of, of what I would call our operating model. Uh, but zoom out, the operating model isn't just about uh, frontline officers, the operating model is the entire constabulary. Everybody plays a part in making sure that we have just enough um, uh, capability in each of those important areas. Uh, but neighbourhood policing, of course, is fundamentally connected to our local communities. You could argue that the whole operating model is based on neighbourhood policing because a response officer driving through a community will gain community intelligence that could lead to something that prevents a problem mm. or interdicts a crime. Um, uh, detectives working with victims will learn information or pass on information that can help to keep a community safe. Our strap line for our neighbourhood offer, as you know Martin, is that everything starts and ends in a neighbourhood and that's because it does. It may start in one and end in a different one, but it's fundamentally the, 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 the space that we occupy so that we can then be a neighbourhood officer, a schools liaison officer, a response officer, a detective, a local investigator. Everybody's in the neighbourhood. So in terms of deciding the resources, um, the starting point is good leadership. I have some great managers and leaders who I believe are connected to our workforce and they know the answer more often than not. Mm. If you approach and support them in the right way, they'll tell you things and you listen, hopefully. Spend more time listening than speaking. And then we come together uh, on a regular basis with some analysis and some evidence base. Uh, and through <coughs> the Assistant Chief Constable who looks after operations and the Deputy Chief Constable who looks after our transformation programme, we come up with what we believe to be the right apportionment. How many can we afford in the domestic abuse team versus the response team. Um, and we check and test that against the demand. We monitor it on a monthly basis. And if we need to, we make flexible changes to mm. stabilize the organization, which is the very first part of our business plan, corporate strategies to stabilize the organization. Yeah. You know, that's a, a really thoughtful, I think a very good answer. But how do I, how do we respond to when people say, look, I just want the Bobby on the beat. Because that's, that's all I want. I just want to bob you on the beat, not all the things that you've just said. And I think it's almost a, a millstone around your neck because I don't remember the last time there were lots and lots of bobbies on the beat. I probably can, you know, when I was in the police in 1980 in the town centres. But how do we keep the public on side when they just say, I just want to bob you on the beat? And all the things that you've said that they need to do, how can we just get that? How can we keep the public not happy, but sort of satisfied that their police presence is there when they need it? And I do understand that, and I, and I, I value the, pres the visible presence of uniformed staff as well. My, my answer to that is that they are there. 
there's just arguably not enough of them to be seen by enough people for them to feel satisfied but they are present they're on foot they're in a car they're on horseback now yeah. um, you know they are present um, as much as they can be uh, the second point is that whilst that is valuable and long may it continue the threat is changing to our public how does somebody patrolling the high street in a high-vis jacket protect a 14-year-old girl being groomed in her bedroom? And so we have to adapt and use some of those resources to tackle cybercrime. The new crimes that are beginning to appear, sextortion, honour-based violence, modern-day slavery, cybercrime. And whilst um, I would love to be able to grow into those new capabilities and keep the, the numbers that we have elsewhere, I can't. I've got to move move them from one place to another and there are always consequences but I would go back to my previous answer that you know we track the threats we threat risk and harm it we've got a, a model where we can try to assess the threat risk and harm to the public uh, wherever possible we'll consult with the public and inform them about what we're intending to do shape the shape the offer and then relay out the you know the the, the resources that we have sometimes we get it uh, wrong uh, and have to adapt, but most of the time I believe that we've stabilised the organisation and our, our staff are doing tremendous work given the, the, the demands that they face. I think both you and I have kind of put our, our, our reputations, certainly our, our, our effort to say neighbourhood policing is back in Gloucestershire. I know it's tough because you still have to do all the attending of, of the road traffic accidents and like town economy, the fights, all the stuff you, and, and the complex stuff as well. How well do you think it's going? Is it making a difference? Well, we, we've achieved a lot in that we now have identified teams um, insulated to the best of our ability um, so that they can deliver um, you know, 24 seven neighborhood policing to, you know, yeah. within the, the limitations that we have. But the next step for us is to start to introduce something called asset-based community development. And you'll, ref you, mm. you'll not refer to Martin yeah. as ABCD. Um, and we're trying to build in that approach with our communities and our partners so that uh, rather than it, it being about us being present all the time, inspiring communities to come together and connect in a particular way through common interests and with a purpose. Evidence will show from the work that we've been doing over the last 12 months that you get more than the sum of its parts in terms of a reward, a 30% drop in antisocial behaviour in one of our pilot sites over the last 12 months and uh, a lift in morale by the, by the community. They start focusing on different things. And the next step for us is to equip our PCSOs and our neighborhood officers with the time, space, and skills to trigger that type of approach to um, community capacity and resilience. Now, it's going to take a bit of time. There aren't instant fixes to this, but that's our pathway. And I'm very confident that if we're allowed to do that and we get good buy-in from our public, which we seem to be getting, there will be some tremendous results for us. And it's not about throwing resource at it because we don't have them. It's about making the most of what we have. That's really helpful because we start off, you know, the, the public want to see a Bobby on the beat, which gives you almost a blank canvas to say how we're going to deliver that. Um, I, I'm grateful that we've retained is it 116 police CSOs, police community support officers. Yes. When I think some forces are saying, you know, we, we can't afford them anymore, we could do things differently. So I, I know we're totally committed to those. Maybe a, a difficult question, but if the Bobby on the beat is a PCSO, we've moved on, we can't have all the officers doing that. What What's the mark of a good PCSO? What would you expect to see, the characteristics of a good police community support officer working in the Cotswolds, working in the forest, working in, in Treadworth or in Cheltenham Town Centre? What, what, what makes a good PCSO? Well, you're quite right, Martin. We've committed to the, you know, to the best of our ability, again, subject to anything happening that is out of our control, to retain all 116 of our PCSOs. They're magnificent people. They work incredibly hard. They're very skilled. Um, some of us, some of them have been with us since the very start of PCSOs and they've matured and they, they pass on that learning to new PCSOs. In fact, we have a new group of PCSOs graduating this Friday. So when the vacancies occur, we fill them, which is wonderful news. Um, but I would expect them to um, be present in their communities wherever they can. It shouldn't just be about patrolling. They should have a purpose. 
and they're very much a part of our daily tasking <coughs> process where senior leaders listen to uh, the threats that have come in overnight, they know what the issues are uh, within those, each of those communities, longer term issues that we're trying to problem solve out, and the PCSOs are directed towards those threats if they're immediate, but ideally insulated to deal longer term with problem solving, whether it's fly tipping in a more rural location or whether it's antisocial behaviour uh, in perhaps a more urban area. Those are articulated, set out by agreement with the public, uh, and they engage with the public to seek and inspire them to contribute to solving the issue as well. Policing is far too important to be left to the police. But the PCSOs have great skills, they know what they're doing, um, we just need to insulate them as much as possible so that they can, okay. they can interact. I think the message is we are committed to keeping our PCSOs, we're absolutely committed to keep a neighbourhood police it will take time to build it up because it did, you don't have to agree, I think it was fallen away. But I know that I'm totally committed to making sure that stays within the county, and I'm grateful that you are as well. One of the, the, the downsides of being in office you know, since 2013 and yourself since the same time, actually, is that only you can hold yourself accountable for when things are getting a bit difficult and not performing very well. And one of the things that almost all the time since I've been commissioner, the public tell me, trying to contact the police can be a bit of a challenge. You know, they would like to tell you stuff, but they go on the phone and it's, your call is very important to us, but actually it doesn't get answered for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So uh, it, it does go up and down, but people are losing confidence, I think, in 101. Is that fair or unfair? It's a challenge nationally to make sure that we have enough people to answer the 101 calls and the 999 calls in a timely fashion. Well, let's focus on uh, 101 yep. because that's entirely within our gift. 999 tends to go through another provider before it hits. Plus, we'll talk about that in a minute. Yes. Um, but setting the context, we have about 161,000 incidents that we, um, we try to respond to uh, every year four crimes at least a day that need full investigation, about 9,000 domestic abuse incidents alone to deal with. We get 73,999 calls a year on average, and last year 233, so nearly a quarter of a million 101 calls. And our staff um, uh, work flat out to do the best they can mm -hmm. to answer the calls. It's not easy. Uh, what I do know is that we have an initial contact survey that we routinely undertake and a user satisfaction survey. So there are the cold stats around how many calls did you answer and in what time, but there's also the public view directly lifted from those two surveys. And in terms of those two most recent surveys, uh, what we've discovered is that it's not the time taken that is the most important facet or, or factor, it's the manner in which they were dealt with by the call taker. And just to reassure you, Martin, in, in our most recent survey, 78% of the people that we surveyed agreed that their call was answered within a reasonable time. 90% of those respondents rated the manner of the call taker as excellent or good. And in terms of user satisfaction, um, nearly 60% of all 101 calls were answered within 40 seconds. Um, uh, and in terms of the free text comments, because we asked people to speak freely about their experience, 86% said that, that nothing needed to improve in the contact, um, and only 7% mentioned that the calls needed to be picked up more quickly. Now I know that that's statistics mm -hmm. and it's surveys and it's a sample, um, they're credible, um, and there will be plenty of people listening saying, well, that's not my experience. It's still, you still need to get better at that, <laughs> yeah. and I accept that, and, and I apologise for any um, you know, deterioration in that service. But um, <coughs> just by way of a very quick case study, um, I had a very nice uh, bit of correspondence from a member of the public the other day who said that they came across a suicide note uh, at their workplace uh, and came across it late, um, indicating that a member, a colleague of theirs, had become depressed uh, and was about to go and commit suicide. They made contact with us, were very praiseworthy about the manner in which they were dealt with, um, and within uh, 70 minutes uh, we had gone back to that individual and left a message for them to say that we'd trace the individual in Sussex on the edge of a cliff, potentially about to commit suicide. And what he was astounded at was that we took him seriously. Um, within minutes we were tracing uh, the individual in another force area 
um, and had actually left a message for him 10 minutes before the hour was up saying that we'd found the individual. So within 60 minutes from call to resolution, um, arguably uh, the public and us helped to save someone's life. So there are plenty of examples where it goes very well. I'm very cognizant that we don't get it right all the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're right. It, it, there's brilliant stuff goes on every day, and, and, and stats can actually confuse the picture because so 90% say it's excellent or good. I hope it's not 10% say it's awful or shocking no. because that's the number you're talking about is quite a lot. And it, it, you know, I get it all the time. It continuously, I, I rang the police, I didn't get through, I had to put the phone down. Is there any way you think we can improve it or, or find other ways they can communicate with us? Because most of the people I speak to just want to live their lives and they only ring the police once every 10 years or so. They should, you know, that's all it is. And if they get the 90% response, it's great. If they don't, if the one time they call, it just doesn't work out, nobody answers for 10 minutes. They, they lose confidence in policing, which is a shame. Um, I'm quite exercised about it, as you know, to make sure that people, if they call the police, they get a first class service. I know you are as well. Is, do you think there's anything we can do just to get that satisfaction rate up and get that confidence back? Because it is, you, you know, people keep coming back with this. There is something we can do that within our change program, we have a public contact program of works, um, which is maturing and um, it captures some technological changes within the, our force control room. It's linking in our initial investigators who triage all the calls. It's linking in our front reception staff, our public contact officers in our police stations. Uh, we're linking it to a, a, a program of work around the culture of our workforce to turn it much more into a, a customer care approach, uh, as well as, of course, dealing with the actual requirements of what the call is wanting from us linking it to the victim satisfaction work and finally the channel management program of works mm. that we have about opening up as many channels for the public to contact us. Not everybody wants to see us, not everybody wants to even phone us. They want to be able to do their business with us online, text us, use technology, but we, we have <coughs> to keep all those channels open. We can't seem to be able to close one down to invest in another. Mm. They just keep widening and widening uh, and we're just pulling together a very advanced piece of work now which will I hope, once implemented, um, polish it off and burr off some of those negative edges that we do experience. I, I do know it's tough, and I, and I know, but 999's under, under stress, was that okay? No. Uh, they, they've gone up, uh, I'm led to believe, nationally. I speak to my colleagues across the country. Everyone's experiencing a huge increase in calls and demand. Um, some forces, I think, have been busier every day in July than they were on Christmas Eve. And Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, some very busy days in the year. So uh, the service is under great, great demand, a uh, great pressure from demand. Uh, the call handling system is um, is under pressure, but we're looking to keep it stable uh, and to make the improvements that we can. So 999 uh, equally has some issues that we're trying to address. So, it's, but it's still a world class service. People can still call us, and we'll. You know, respond to them to the best of our ability. Yeah, and and I think I know what you're going to say here. I, I'm not for sure. What people really want, if they've got a a big issue or any issue, they want to make sure the police will give them a good hearing. Be it their child's being groomed, they think they're being f defrauded. Is the training for the officers and the front line, the PCSOs, are you confident they're given the right information that people can access the really deep parts of the organisation that you know people don't see on a day to day basis? Can a PCSO get you from here to this most specialist department? Are, are you happy it's, that's w working now? It's, no, it's not that sophisticated yet. It's part of the programme of works, and I must be honest with you that it, it's not that sophisticated yet. Um, we need to start taking out some of the demands, some of which is imposed by ourselves. We don't have, for instance, a centralised directory that we can use. We have a number of directories which cast doubt in people's minds and they're ringing our own phone numbers to get a telephone number to ring a colleague. Now that can't continue and we have to squash that and design it out so that we can free it up for the public, take the pressure off of our core handlers and then enable uh, the core handlers and the public where it's appropriate to access other parts of the organisation. You know, I think we cover quite a lot of ground and I'm really very grateful to you. I mean, my assessment of the constabulary, it's punching above its weight, it's very stable. 
and I am very grateful to you and your officers for the work you do because I know that you go out of your way to look after the staff and the officers and I hope they feel and see that my job is to hold you to account you know we occasionally talk about more difficult things and we do that privately often but overall I think the public would like to thank you as well so I'll do that on many of their behalf thank you but I do also hope the public recognize it's a tough time right now and um, it, it can't be perfect all the time is there any we started off with your assessment of the force. You've been here a year, a little bit more as the Chief Constable, a bit more before that as, as the DCC, the Deputy Chief Constable. How optimistic are you for the future of the force? Well, I'm very genuinely optimistic and, and I often say, look how far we've come, but yeah. look how far we have to go. Uh, there are still challenges operationally, financially, um, and there's a lot of work to be done yeah. with just a few of us. But if we engage with the public well and we get great support from the public, we have an ambitious plan of works. Yeah. We need to carry on remaining stable, but also develop and we want to innovate. Strong and stable. And huh? and yeah. Sorry. That, but that, so there's a lot to do and we're ambitious. <coughs> as, yeah. as a constabulary, in many ways, our size is a great asset to us because being quite small is, is arguably yeah. more strategic than being large and right. slow to move. And that's, you know... I'm not being um, critical of uh, larger forces, it's just harder to move quicker, arguably, okay. uh, when you're a little bit larger. So mm -hmm. let's use that to our advantage. We've got a fabulous workforce and we're very well supported. Okay. Well, uh, one final question. I know some are concerned that chief officers, people, chief constables, good ones are hard to come by. I agree with that. They're pretty tough. They're not many, there's lots around, but uh, I'm very grateful you're here. But the simple is saying don't, don't stick around very long. Are you going to stick around for a while? Well, you kindly offered me a five-year contract, and I did agree um, to take it. And so um, unless <coughs> something unforeseen happens to me, I should be here for at least another four and a half years, Martin. And on that note, I think we should thank the public for listening, and thank you for that commitment, and thank you for all you do. Thank you, Martin. Thanks.